Hello, I'm Eric Holdeman, and this is Disaster Zone, a show about emergencies and disasters that happen anywhere and at any time. Today we're talking about cybersecurity, where cyber threats are coming from and what can be done to counter them, and how each of us has a personal role to play. And we're talking with Mike Hamilton, a cybersecurity expert. Mike has extensive experience in securing government networks. And Mike, it's great to have you on the show. We've talked about doing this for some time now. I'm and, happy to uh, be here. I, I think it'll be a show that's very interesting to any number of people, no matter whether they're just citizens or government agencies, even the private sector. I think. Well, I hope so. Okay. And so, you know, I described you as an expert. How about sharing a little bit of what your background is, how you became interested in cybersecurity? I think perhaps much earlier than a lot of folks. Yeah, I, so nominally I think uh, I got interested uh, in about 1988. I was uh, still a graduate student at USC. That's 26 years ago, I know, that because that's why I moved ago. here. Thanks, so. Eric. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, uh, uh, at the time, I uh, had a lot of uh, uh, computing to do uh, as a graduate student, and I ended up getting a job at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And somehow in all of that mix, I ended up uh, running up against a, uh, uh, a man who turned out to be one of the most famous cyber criminals of all time. His name is Kevin Mitnick. And if he sees this, he'll think it's okay. <laughs> I've heard that name. <laughs> yeah, he's, he, he actually uh, autographed one of his books for him. He said, Mike, I still have your password. <laughs> so yeah. uh, when, I, uh, when I started work at the Jet Propulsion Lab, I was doing satellite oceanography for NASA. And uh, the, the computing infrastructure eventually got to be more interesting than the research. And I just decided I was going to go out and tell everybody I was a firewall expert. I was not. <laughs> uh, but uh, I figured it out and uh, spent some time in business uh, hand rolling firewalls and selling those in a business in Southern California. Uh, and then left that, went on to do a lot of contract work, eventually became the uh, managing consultant for VeriSign Global Security Consulting. So I've been in and out of a couple of hundred corporations. Uh, when I was uh, 44, my one and only daughter was born. And uh, if you're going to be dad, you can't go to work on an airplane, drive rental cars, eat in restaurants, and live in hotels. Yeah. So I decided to join the public sector and became the information security officer for the city of Seattle. And here we are. Okay, how long did you do that for the city? So About seven years, a little more than seven years. Okay, all right. And, um, you know, one of the things about cybersecurity, at least in my limited non IT, background in this is that people designed systems and networks and all that and what I, at least what I've seen in the past is where they didn't pay any attention to security at all. I mean there was no security. So when did cybersecurity start to become an issue? I mean you know that mm. where people said oh yeah no we should be do something about that. Yeah that's that's a good question. I, you know I think there were a couple of breakpoints along the way and if you remember back there used to be you know viruses and they melted networks and that was what they were for. And yeah. it was, uh, the actors behind that were largely uh, young and uh, wanting to demonstrate how good they were. So there was the Melissa and the I Love You and the Slam sequel Slammer and things like that. Uh, but then uh, the, uh, the whole thing got monetized and it became organized crime stealing your money. And they got very, very good at doing that. And I, th I think that we have, so that was uh, annoyance, uh, then became uh, an issue we have to deal with. And I, now I think we've reached another break point where it's starting to become more dire because now it's becoming more about the infrastructure that is held up, enabled, uh, in some cases completely dependent on information technology that runs the things that keep us alive, the services that we need for just our quality of life. You know, 911 center, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think there's been a couple of breakpoints along the way, and um, the the new world is brand new, and I think we're still trying to get our arms around that. Okay, and so if you're going to put a date on this, was it 1988 when cyber started to show up more, mm. to trying to protect from the 12 year old in the basement? Or? I think it was early 90s, you know, when you think about those things, the, the sequel slammer yeah. and uh, some, of those, some of those things were very destructive to networks. 
those were all early to mid 90s. Uh, bef before that, it uh, wasn't such a big deal. Mostly because before that, the world wasn't networked the way it is now. No. Right, right. So, I mean, just this aspect, you touched on it here, but I, I can't think of any aspect, whether it's cars, airplanes, our food, our drugs, our retail sales, our design systems, everything is b driven by computers today. Yep. It, I mean, there's no, if you if you if you think about so this is why uh, the local government is fascinating to me. Um, it, it, Homeland Security has developed these sectors yeah. that are right. called critical infrastructure, and Homeland Security will tell you that this is a big private sector problem. But if you think about your city, your county, and the things that they do for you, um, the communications for law enforcement and traffic management mm -hmm. and uh, uh, water purification and waste treatment and emergency management. IT makes all of that happen. If you think about it, uh, if your house is on fire and the fire department shows up to put the fire out on your house, what had to happen? Uh, the 911 center had to be there and receiving calls. Radio communications had to work. Uh, roads had to be clear and water's got to come out of the hose. And IT makes all that stuff happen. Even so, the water out of the hose. Even the water out of the hose. Yeah, right, right. At the truck and back in the pumps, it fills the system. And That's right. Uh, okay. So, how about talking about some of these details? I knew, one of the pieces, can I get this out of the way, is after 9-11, they were talking about, well, anybody, uh, uh, you know, an extremist who wants to attack the United States could be in Tora Bora, which, mm -hmm. I don't know, the caves or whatever, and could do terrible damage from there. I don't know whether that's ever revealed itself to be uh, a significant threat from that perspective. I don't know, any thoughts about that? Well, uh, I can tell you that there are uh, countries in the world that don't like us very much, and uh, by and large, they do not have the capability to perform any kind of military action. But in a completely low to no risk way, uh, they can sit right where they are and look around for exposures of our infrastructure and prepare at the time of their choosing to turn off some of these services. And so I, I do think that is a threat. Um, and I can tell you that just with respect to the measurements that we took while I was at City of Seattle, the doorknob twisting g is going up by those particular actors. And There's by doorknob no twisting, it means people trying to get in? Sure, the, just the reconnaissance. You know. Okay. Uh, uh, most of a, a cyber attack is actually the reconnaissance and the targeting, um, and then when it's ready to go, it's just push yeah. a button and it You're happens. looking for the unlocked door, the That's unlocked exactly window. exactly right. And where you, you, you found uh, exposure where you can get in when you want to get in. Sure. Okay. Because right. they're out there. And what about the, um, the, the criminal? aspect of this. You touched on it uh, yeah, this briefly. Is, uh, this is it, an it interesting like nexus. East, Eastern Europe seems to be rife with uh, these types of folks. They are, and uh, if you're uh, following current events, uh, you know that uh, uh, the Russians and the Americans are uh, poking fingers at one another right now. And uh, the best organized cyber criminals in the world are in Russia and Eastern Europe, as you point out. Yeah. They're also very nationalistic. And, you know, a couple of more pokes in the eye, and there just may be a demonstration not, not uh, conducted by the Russian government, mm -hmm. uh, but a demonstration that gives us something else to worry about than, you know, the, uh, uh, how well we're, NATO is going to protect Ukraine. Okay. And, um, you know, this is not only a possibility with uh, the Russians and organized criminals there, but there are other actors who do not have those skills. They can go hire them. So uh, you read the same things I do. You know that the Iranians are getting very good at this, and they are a threat. And mm -hmm. you know that the North Koreans have been working and on this for actually, a long time. And actually, the U.S. was specifically, along with Israel, Israel targeted for, I, I'm trying to remember the... It's called Stuxnet. Stuxnet mm -hmm. took out some of their... Um, nuclear capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has been weaponized and used yeah. to do other things, and we think by the Iranians. Back at us, yeah. or back at others. Back at others. Okay, all right. So, you know, what are these tools of the trade? I mean, you know, if, if you're fighting a conventional war, uh, that, you know, you got your guns, the artillery, and uh, what have you, what, what are the tools of the trade for cybersecurity? I mean, of 
not security of the attackers, really. Yeah, well, how deep do you want me to go here? No, we can get pretty technical. No. <laughs> we, we don't want to give away the farm, but okay. just generally. So uh, uh, one, of, one of the things that you need to do uh, in order to take over someone's computer is you have to crack open something that's vulnerable. And you know when Microsoft sends out their patches every month, they're fixing those vulnerable <clears throat> things. A lot of people know about those and they've weaponized ways to break them open and take your computer over. So uh, this is, this is the, the, the highly technical part that I'm only going to talk about for a minute. So you use debuggers to reverse engineer software to find out where they've made procedure calls that don't bound the memory properly so that you know exactly what to throw in there to overflow the memory and put executable code into the running stack of the operating system. Okay, that was for the geeks. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, the tools are largely available uh, for free. They're all over the place, uh, the easy tools. So there are uh, password guessers. There are uh, 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 pieces of software that use the form pages on web applications and they inject things into the form fields, try to get into the database or pull stuff out of the database. Yeah. Um, those are all highly commoditized. It just sounds like the, the, the house has a lot of windows and doors and oh, yeah. entry points. Oh yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, um, I, I, I say this uh, infrequently, but I really believe this. Um, if we changed uh, some of the aspects of the fundamental protocols that run the internet, this problem goes off a cliff. And I know that there is work being done to do exactly that. The Australians in particular, I read some time ago, were looking to uh, uh, correct some of the problems with these protocols that run the internet that were developed in the 70s for a completely different right. reason. Right, totally open yeah. atmosphere. Well, we're almost done with this first half of the show, but I wanted to ask you about, um, and you talked about some of the vulnerabilities, but I know in talking to um, government agencies and uh, IT directors and that about uh, bringing your own device, you have one, I have one over here on mm -hmm. the, in my bag, uh, BYOD, bring your own device to work, um, weak passwords, no passwords, yeah. stuff like that. What, how, how important are those individual things that people have in the workplaces? Uh, th they are important, but uh, just from the perspective of uh, running an organization that is focused on securing an enterprise, you can have policies around things like that, and you can have technologies that assist that. And, you know, I mean, to tell you the truth, when, when we reach uh, uh, an adequate tipping point where everybody's got some kind of smart device, yeah. um, you, you know, one of the things that would be good for government in particular to do is to pull back on some of these insane policies that we have. So, for example, the, the policy of de minimis use. Yeah. You can use the government technology for your own personal purposes if it doesn't cost any extra money, create a productivity problem, or a security right. issue. Okay, right. I can prove that it does all three. But when there's enough of these out there, we can just cut off access to Gmail and Facebook and everything else because here's where you'll do it. So there's a security upside there as well. Right. Um, I, I really, in my view, some, some of the policies need to be brought into the 21st century uh, because a government, as you know, doesn't move along quickly. No. It's not nimble. Right. Uh, if we don't get nimble, uh, we're, look, we're looking at a landmine coming up. Yeah, always trying to play catch up, I yep. guess, right? Well, listen, we're already halfway through our program, so this has been great, Mike, and uh, don't go anywhere. Okay. And for you folks at home, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be talking more about cybersecurity and what personal role you can play to protect your data and what we should be teaching our children to. So uh, watch this message, and we'll be right back. The Regional Public Information Network is your one-stop resource for news about local and regional disruptions. Go to rpin.org for breaking news on everything from road closures and weather warnings to regional emergencies. RPIN brings you information from more than 60 responding agencies serving King, Pierce, and Snohomish counties. Subscribe and you'll receive news alerts wherever you are by email, text messaging, or pager. Visit us at rpin.org and download emergency contact cards for your family. Be in touch, stay in touch. Welcome back. We're talking today with Mike Hamilton, a cybersecurity uh, expert. And Mike, we're going to kind of pick up where we left off, talking more about the government side, and then we'll move to that individual side we uh, said, told the audience we'd do. Um, 
And as we were talking about at the break ourselves here, I was thinking, what does SCADA stand for? Because sometimes you use terminology that's just understood by all, everybody. So explain to our audience the functions of the Supervisory Control Data Acquisitions, or Industrial Control Industrial system. Control Systems, yeah. I think uh, <laughs> the, the, the shorthand that has emerged, I think, is, is ICS, just because it rolls off the tongue yeah. a little better. But, you know, it's also the question. Incident Command System. It is the Incident Command System. <laughs> which is different. It's a different ICS. Especially when I'm talking to you, I would never <laughs> use that term. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, SCADA Systems, uh, Industrial Control, um, is a way to make something mechanical happen with an electrical signal. I mean, you can think of it yeah. that way. And they're built around these things called programmable logic controllers. And you send it a very simple string of bytes and it knows how to route <coughs> something one way or the other, electrical current one way or the other. Uh, the easy way to think about it is this. Um, there is a, uh, a place in Seattle where, metaphorically, uh, a person can twist a knob and a dam will open up in Idaho. That's what SCADA does. And so that's used in traffic management. So uh, sending out um, uh, signal timing and uh, sending out uh, sign uh, uh, messages, moving cameras. Uh, you can think about that in opening the valves that bring in water, um, mixing chlorine with water, uh, waste treatment processes, things like that. These are all these control systems. Um, in fact, uh, when you were at the Port of Tacoma, Port of Tacoma has a lot of control systems mm -hmm. for uh, switching tracks yeah. for the trains, opening and lowering bridges. Uh, I think the Port of Tacoma has got a whole lot of them. So, okay, so they're they're really everywhere. And, you know, and so what's the concern about SCADA? I remember back when uh, Y2K was rolling around, mm -hmm. there was a big concern about it just not being Y2K ready, mm -hmm. you know, for that date. But today, uh, uh, again, the, all these systems have to be um, protected, and some, I don't know whether it's firewalled, whatever, you, how, how, how do these become protected so someone all of a sudden just can't turn on the dam or overload it with chlorine or? Yeah, uh, and, and that's exactly the danger. And so, so over time, so your uh, initial comment was stuff gets built, and yeah. it was never secured, right? Right, And uh, that is especially true about SCADA systems and industrial control. They were never intended to be connected to public networks, but administrators and operators need remote access. And over time, you end up with these things being somehow in some way connected to the network of networks known as the internet. And in fact, there's a very interesting system called Shodan that maps, just like Google goes and maps everything, all the content on, right. the, on the internet, Shodan maps uh, where there are industrial control systems, SCADA, and all kinds of other things that are connected to the internet. So it's real easy to go find them. So uh, how do you secure them? First of all, you do not allow them to be connected <laughs> to public networks. That's, that's, yeah. that's a real problem. Um, secondarily, I think that um, there is a goodly amount of vendor interaction here that was never historically applied. And I won't name any vendors, but I, I, I can tell you that uh, we have had uh, HVAC systems, for example, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had those compromised and under the control of somebody on the other side of the world. And the reason was because the vendors set that stuff in place and they don't touch it. It works, let's not touch it. And so there needs to be ongoing maintenance, security patching, vulnerability detection and closure, things like that. And uh, the, the vendors are just now getting religion about this. So I think, okay. you know, in five to 10 years, I think it's going to be better. Right now, I think uh, our soft underside is exposed pretty badly. Okay, and you know, we talked about the smart grid. That's a, a, a term used to have mm -hmm. more digitized electrical control systems. If we're starting with new systems today, are we better off than we were. Uh, so that's a good question because um, so there's the there's the question of the quality of the technology. There's also the question of its uh, of its application. So uh, in, in the case of the smart grid, uh, in today's world, somebody comes to your house every couple of months with a clipboard and a piece of paper, writes down numbers, and you get a bill. In tomorrow's world, the meter on the side of your house will wirelessly be reporting. Uh, your power consumption every 15 minutes, and not just your home power consumption, but your refrigerator, and your dryer, and your freezer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So that means that 
somehow inside your home, all of those appliances need to network with the meter. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong? All right. So, you know, the 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 logical equivalent of home invasion is probably going to start occurring when we have reached a uh, uh, good penetration of this, the smart grid. Now, g you know, going back to your question, uh, I think that if the uh, technology is deployed in such a way that there is some kind of oversight and monitoring and detection of anomalous events and then some kind of response process, uh, we, we can mitigate a lot of that. But um, certainly, typically in governments, and I think in, in areas like this where we haven't really plowed the ground, there's a real tendency to manage by landmine. When it happens, we'll fix it. Yeah. Uh, because nobody wants to make these investments right now, right? We've, we, we've never demonstrated that this is a problem. Why should I invest? So we'll find out. Okay. Well, one last uh, question on this is, you know, what else is happening here in Washington State? There's a number of organizations doing things, regional monitoring. Mm -hmm. And that, how about talking briefly about some sure. of those? Sure, yeah, and I, I th that's a great question. Thanks for asking that, because uh, our state, uh, not only in my view, but in uh, the, view, the view of a lot of people nationally, uh, and in, in fact, the <coughs> Deputy Undersecretary for Cybersecurity for uh, Homeland Security, NPPD, National Protective Programs Division, uh, was out here a couple of weeks ago just to, to see just what is going on out here. Yeah, is that is that Caitlin Durkovich or is that somebody else? No, it's uh, Phyllis Schneck. She okay. was uh, recently with McAfee and has now okay. joined the pub public sector and she's uh, she has the metabolism of a hummingbird and an <laughs> IQ of 180. She's, she's really bright. Oh yeah. Uh, but uh, we uh, briefed the Deputy Undersecretary on the regional monitoring that we do. We're watching the attack surface of our region by aggregating security logs from uh, getting close to 20 organizations, including uh, six maritime ports, soon seven. Um, we uh, integrate well with our fusion center. That is the, 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 uh, the place that um, uh, processes suspicious activity reports. So we're, we're one of three fusion centers in the country that has a cyber analyst uh, mm -hmm. that is actually looking at logical Suspicious activities, somebody scanning my network, this password right. guessing won't stop, right. you know. Um, the National Guard uh, has undertaken a project to develop an incident response plan for our state for significant cyber disruption. So in the event some of these things really do come to pass, we got to know who's on first, who's in charge, what's going to happen. Right. Uh, we network very well with our private sector here. Uh, there's an organization called Circus, and I always botch the acronym, so I'm just going to call it Circus. Uh, and that's uh, the, the Fortune Corporations in our region have allowed their analysts and forensic specialists to participate in this so that... It's we like can, we Fortune 500 companies. It, yeah. For the most part. Yeah. Uh, Amazon, Expedia, Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, they sh we, we share information very well between public and private sectors, but that's also a ready bench in the event that we need analysts and forensic help, et cetera, if we do have one of these disruptions. So I don't know of any other place in the country that's yeah. doing that. Uh, l lastly, I'll point out that uh, uh, Kirk Bailey, the CISO of the University of Washington. That chief information chief security, information security, security uh, officer. Uh, uh, has for the last, I think, 18 years been doing a quarterly meeting uh, where 200 to 300 cybersecurity practitioners, executives, vendors, okay. consultants, everybody uh, assembles, uh, networks, shares information, listens to a couple of good presentations. Um, we know each other here better than any place else in the country, and okay. I think our preparedness here and the way that we look at this problem is sufficiently distanced from other efforts to, re to really call us special. And, and you know, um, this is back 2003, this is before BM, before Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, but we did a cybersecurity exercise associated with another terrorism. It was not a requirement, but it was done, this mm -hmm. public-private collaboration. So you're right, there's a strong history mm -hmm. there. Well, so we got about four minutes and wanted to run, hit some of these pieces real quick for the individuals sure. at home, because uh, people are watching. Uh, so let's talk about what's the solutions that I call Joe and Sally can do, protect themselves, uh, and, and maybe what they ought to be training their kids. You can just shut yourself off from the world, but that isn't very functional in our highly networked world. And no, it is not. Uh, so if I was going to make uh, some 
personal, individual, family type recommendations. Uh, the, 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 the first one is about this issue of vulnerabilities. You, you, you have to update your computing systems. So set them to automatically receive and apply these updates, whether they come yeah. from Microsoft, yeah. Apple, Google, now that the Android operating system is popular. Um, th that's first and foremost. Um, I think that it's also a very good idea just with respect to financial transactions um, b because this, this cyber crime is, has gotten so epidemic. I mean, there are hundreds of billions of dollars leaving this country and disappearing. Yeah. And we, you know, we've got to do something. And personal responsibility is a lot of that. One way to, uh, to mitigate your risk there is to use a special system just for those transactions. And there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, you know, get free Ubuntu Linux and put it on a beater computer and don't use it for anything else but doing your banking. It is highly unlikely that you're going to trip over you know, the, the booby-trapped websites. Don't read your email on it so you don't open these attachments. That's pretty you good You just have too. a dedicated system. For just it. have a dedicated system. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'd be very wary of the mobile stuff because right now, you know, organized criminals are not stupid. They know where their market is. And if yeah. everything's going mobile, the crime is going mobile. Okay. So be aware of that and um, just it's to... It's actually one of the things I've avoided. I thought about, well, me wouldn't, too. That be, wouldn't that be convenient? But I was thinking, eh. Not <laughs> doing it. Not yeah. having it, no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and just one thing for, uh, for the younger audience, um, Google never forgets. Anyth anything you do, anything you put online is going to follow you for the rest of your life and there can be uh, bad outcomes from that and you know, uh, cyber bullying is yeah. a problem. If that comes up, you should always tell somebody, tell an adult about that. But you know, putting crazy stuff about yourself online yeah. is going to come back to bite you. Yeah. Something to tell our kids. Yeah. Well, listen, we only have about a minute left. Um, so real quickly, is it, you look for the future, uh, to the future, what are you most concerned about with cyber, very briefly? Uh, I'm concerned about this <coughs> infrastructure disruption and you know, these, these services that uh, essentially keep us alive, right? Life safety, yep. life sustaining quality of life services, you know all about those. Um, it's w the situation where we are now, uh, uh, local government, the owner operator of a lot of that, has never had the incentive or the regulatory oversight to get after that problem. You know, again, it's management by landmine. And um, whoever hits that landmine first uh, is going to really take yeah, it on the chin. And I think everybody's thought process is going to crystallize that day, and we're going to understand the value of investing in those controls. Okay. And, you know, just to wrap it up, I, I can tell you from a personal side, when uh, they started making me have a password on my work uh, <laughs> cell phone, um, you know, from that standpoint, I thought, oh, what a pain in the butt to do that. But um, as I've become smarter about all these things, my personal cell phone has a password on it because I don't want all that data to fall into the wrong hands That's right, from you that don't. standpoint. So a little bit of preventive work uh, is great. So, Mike, our Disaster Zone coffee cup there that uh, is oh, provided cool. to each of our guests for being on so the no show. So no one has ever used this before? This is only mine? <clears throat> Hopefully not. Okay, Just the cool. janitor. Thank I you. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for being uh, on the show, and uh, I hope everybody pays attention to all the great information. All right. Well, thanks, so, Eric, and thanks yeah. for asking me yes. on. And for you folks uh, at home, this brings us to the end of our show for today. Thanks for tuning in and learning more about what you and others can do to become better prepared for our disasters, including cybersecurity. Remember, if you're going to get prepared, today is a good day to start. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye bye.